I'm certainly glad and feel honored to be here in your midst to want to experience this common vocation that we all share, essentially to being disciples of Jesus. And the thoughts I'm about to share with you this morning is just thoughts that come from the heart of anyone who feels first and foremost invited to share, to follow Jesus. And then secondly, from responding to this call from the natural condition in which a person was born, either African-American, African-European, or whatever. Some time ago, after Pope Francis had written his encyclical letter on Lauda to see, care for creation, we hosted a group of uh, American businessmen from Texas. And as we discussed this with them, they, they, they kept coming up with a question, but how, can, how does this encyclical speak to the American Catholic? Then, 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 so then uh, I suggested to them, but can we rephrase this question? Can we, can we, can we, you know, say, how does this encyclical speak to American uh, Catholics who happen to be American? I say that for me is very crucial. I think when Pope Francis speaks, he doesn't speak to nations and races and tribes. He speaks to humanity invited to be disciples of Jesus. And, and we respond first and foremost to this. For there's no gospel for Africans, there's no gospel for Americans, and there's no gospel for Italians or Europeans. There is one gospel that all of us, created in the image and likeness of God, we seek to respond to. And in responding to that, of course, there are conditions of our lives and existences and areas of life and living do affect our response. So the figure at the center of our reflection this morning is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And so I say I think that it should be kind of clear in our minds what we mean by the Holy Spirit and who we think the Holy Spirit is. And this is not an idle discussion. Because several of you, or they've been in this church, some authors have referred to the Holy Spirit even as the forgotten God. In the sense that not so much mention is made about the Holy Spirit. And it took in a lot of places the charismatic renewal to draw the attention of a lot of Catholics to the presence, the life, and the activity of the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean every Sunday when in reciting the creed, we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, Lord and the giver of life. One, if we refer to the Holy Spirit as Lord, then it means we associate the Holy Spirit with God, the Father, and the Creator. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is not a creature. He's a creator. He's God and creator. He's part of this. So that has to be clear. The Holy Spirit, therefore, is not a creature, the Holy Spirit, one of the two, one, uh, one person of the Trinity, is a creator, creator God, adored with God the Father and the Son, and therefore, in our relationship with him, we are relating with God. He is God to us, and he is God for us. Then we say also that he is giver of life. And when we refer to the Holy Spirit as the giver of life, then necessary, this again, anybody who picks up the scriptures, the Bible, and goes through, is struck by how often, especially in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is referred as to the giver of life. In John's Gospel, the third chapter, the discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus ended with that, with Jesus being referred to, uh, the Holy Spirit being referred to as the giver of life. And then Paul, in his letter to the Romans, several times refers to Jesus as uh, the giver of life. 
In John's Gospel, chapter 6, when Jesus talks about bread and the need for people to eat his flesh, he would also say there is a spirit that gives life. The flesh is nothing. So, it's not a difficulty finding, you know, places in the scripture where the Holy Spirit is presented as being a life giver or the one who gives life. For us then this morning, recognizing that the Holy Spirit is creator, God, and that he gives life or he bestows life, it may be interesting for us this one then to say, what kind of life does the Spirit give? How does he give that life? And what does he intend that life to be? Life for us. So, how does the Holy Spirit give life or when does he give life to us? Clearly, the Holy Spirit gives life to us in baptism. When we baptize in the Lord, he bestows his gift and his spirit on us. And so bestowing his gift and his spirit on us enables us, as it were, to share in the life of God. When we pray, we commune again with the spirit. When we celebrate the sacraments, the spirit shares his life with us. And sometimes when we also suffer in communion with Jesus, it's also an occasion where the Spirit bestows his life on us. Then, if that is the case, what is this life that the Spirit bestows on us? It is a rebirth. It is re being born again in the life of the Spirit, so being born again as children of God. And in this rebirth, we are therefore confirmed in our identity as children of God, if you want, adopted children of God. So the Spirit then divinizes us. It likens us with God. It kind of appropriates us with God and makes us divine. And when that is the case, then we also need to remember that the Spirit making us divine does that through a process. How does the Spirit make us divine? How does the Spirit share its life with us? And the Spirit makes us divine by putting to death the works of the flesh in our bodies. The Spirit makes us divine by putting to death the works of the flesh in our lives, by putting to death the works of the body in our lives. So three things then that we retain about the Holy Spirit is that he is God. He gives us birth and gives us new life. And then kind of established or begins within us the divine life, the life of God himself. And he does that by putting to death in our bodies the works of the flesh, the works of the body. You can read about it in the Paul's letter to the Romans, the 8th chapter and the 11th verse, the 11 and 13 verse. So now that we know the Holy Spirit, we can now go on now to consider what it means when we say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We know who is then upon us. When Isaiah first pronounced this prophecy, Isaiah chapter 61, this was in the context of the restoration of God's people after the exile. The sins of Israel had led Israel into Babylonian captivity and had languished in cap Babylonian captivity for 70 years. At the end of it, Isaiah pronounces this prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and it's part of God restoring his people, the restoration of God's people, the bringing back of God's people to Jerusalem. That's when Isaiah pronounces this. Now, since I saw all of you rise as Catholics and all, I like to assume that all of you know the scriptures from the end to the end. <laughs> Beginning to the end, right? And so, and so naturally coming here with this Congress team, you probably felt like opening the Bible to read exactly what it says, right? So, so you must have read Isaiah chapter 61, to say exactly how Isaiah put this, right? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you did, if you did, 
then you know then there's no way you could you could you could avoid being struck by a difference. When Isaiah quoted, he said, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and all of that, and then announce the year of the Lord's favor." Right, and then Isaiah goes on to add one other expression, which is. Uh, you did your homework good. <laughs> and Isaiah says, and the day of vengeance of our God. So Isaiah's prophecy says the Lord has come to announce the year of favor of our God and the day of vengeance of our God. This is missing in Luke when Jesus stands in the synagogue to refer this prophecy unto himself. So what is the difference? When Isaiah pronounces this prophecy for the first time, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me to do all of this, to announce the year of favor of our God and the day of vengeance of our God. When Jesus quotes this Isaiah and says, this day this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears, it is without the day of vengeance of our God. So why is that not present on the lips of Jesus? Again, you go to the book of the prophet Isaiah and read about all of this. For Isaiah, the day of vengeance is not a vindictive, it's about the, vind it's not about the vindictive God. Because in this second, second and the third part of the prophecy of Isaiah, the Lord is presented several times as a, as, as a man of war, as, as a warrior. It's God who comes to fight against his enemy. And the point of God fighting against his enemy, at the end of it, then they say, because God is filled with vengeance. Vengeance for what? God's vengeance is when God's property is finished in the hands of somebody who is not God. When God's property finishes in the domain and the dominion and power of something that is not God, then God is full of vengeance. Then God acts to claim for himself that which belongs to him. So in the context of this uh, situation of the exile, the day of vengeance of our God is God exercising his power to bring unto himself the people of Israel, Abraham's children, whom he had claimed for himself. So God's vengeance is when God shows his power to claim for himself that which belongs to him. In that sense, the day of vengeance is already some expression of salvation which will take place in Jesus. So one can almost conclude then that when Jesus stands before the synagogue in Nazareth, he knows he's come to fulfill that. He doesn't repeat it because it's now taking place in the life of Jesus. And so he talks about the day of favor of our God. That the day of vengeance, that's now here with us. God has come to redeem and to save his people. So this is Isaiah using this expression. And when he uses this, it is God who has come not only to announce good to glad tidings to the poor, it is not God who has come, it is not a God who sends a messenger to announce the year of favor, but God who also comes to claim for himself that which belongs to him. And it is basically to set people free from sin and anything that drives them away from God. And for you again, Catholics and experts of the Bible, <laughs> now your, your laughter is a laughter of disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you seem to be saying that it's not quite true, <laughs> but, but, but it is. It is because you remember the prophecy of Zechariah, right? When John the Baptist was born and Zechariah's tongue to a losing, what did he say? Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, he's come to set us free, right? Okay, and to save us from our enemies so that we can worship God without fear all the days of our lives. The freedom to worship God without fear is a freedom from sin and everything that keeps you away from God. So the day of vengeance of our God is what Zechariah repeats. 
The grace to be able to worship God, to dedicate yourself, to give yourself completely to God without fear and without any obstacle is already an experience of God's power and the effect of his vengeance. So Isaiah does that, and that's what he tells us. Who this person is that the Spirit of God is upon, Isaiah doesn't quite tell us. Some say it is the King Cyrus who set Israel free from bondage. Some would find some other people, but some refer to also to a Messiah or Messianic figure who is coming. When Jesus, however, stands in the synagogue in Nazareth and applies this to himself with this small modification of the drop of the day of vengeance, Jesus says that this day, this scripture is being fulfilled in your ears. And Jesus, therefore, applies all of this to himself. On him, the spirit of the Lord is descended and has come to fill him and has made him announce the glad tidings, the year of God's favor, and something again which Isaiah did not add, to open those in prison and set free those in prison and proclaim liberty to all of them. We will not get into detail about what is happening here in the Gospel of Luke because Luke has brought two things together. The, the traditional celebration of the year of uh, Jubilee in the Old Testament and then the sense of true fasting according to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58 says that when you really fast, that's when you set free your prisoners and that's when you let all those in bondage go free. Jesus has brought that and made that part of the program of the Jubilee. So it's not only the announcement of a year of favor of our God, but also liberation for captives and all who live in all forms of bondage. This is why Jesus makes his program. And he lives under the influence of the Spirit. And we know that. Jesus was led into the desert to be tempted by the Spirit. Jesus was conceived by the overshadowing of the spirit over Mary. And Jesus, when he's baptized in the Jordan again, the clouds open and the spirit of the Lord descends upon him and the Father speaks. So the anointing of Jesus in the power of the spirit is all true at the beginning of the gospel. Jesus therefore begins his ministry in the anointing of the spirit. And since we've said that the spirit is God, and he comes to divinize and all, we need to recognize that in the anointing of Jesus, it is not the Holy Spirit making Jesus God. Because Jesus is already the Son of God. The anointing of the Spirit, therefore, is to inaugurate the mission of this Son of God who has now come in flesh to live and to share our lives. So the Spirit in Jesus' life is clear. Every, every page of the Gospel tells about Jesus working on the, in, the, in, the, in the anointing of the Spirit. And the consequence is what? The Father delights in him. The one in whom the Father is well pleased. In the anointing of Jesus, Jesus pleases the Father, the beloved Son. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And that is the consequence of Jesus' anointing. And he begins his ministry uh, proclaiming God's favor on all who had come to him. God's favor which is proclaimed, the result of which is the poor have the good news preached to them, people in prison and bondage are set free, and all who are indebted are, 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 are allowed to go, makes Jesus' announcement of the year of God's favor Announcement of a moment of, of, of as it were, reintegration, re-enfranchisement. Anything that has happened to break up the community, to have some live in boundaries, some live in periphery, some live whatever, with the year of the Lord's favor on the lips of Jesus, there's reintegration, re-enfranchisement of God's people. If you want, in the language of Pope Francis these days, we talk about inclusion. In Jesus' announcement of the year of God's favor, we are announcing a new period of inclusion. God's children and all belong now together. None is set aside, none lives on the periphery, and none is excluded. It becomes, therefore, a new program of social inclusiveness. 
all of us belonging together because all of us ultimately are God's children with the same dignity and with the same as with the honor and right. So Jesus announces this for us. And so announcing this, Jesus then, following the issues you want to deal with, so Jesus in the anointing of the Spirit announces this. And so the poor have the good news preached to them. It's the good news of this re-enfranchisement. It's the good news of inclusion. It's the good news of all now finding place in the Father's house. It's the good news of nobody living on the periphery or nobody being excluded. All rediscovering and finding our dignity again as children of God. Created in the image and likeness and now set free and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. With this message being pronounced by Jesus, we, then, we may then go on to ask, you want us to look at all who are living in the spirit, therefore act justly. They love good or goodness, and they walk humbly with our God. In the case of Jesus, it's not an issue trying to find out walking humbly with our God. That was his life, in whom the Father was pleased. Between Jesus and the Father, there wasn't a question of walking humbly with our God. Jesus lived and walked always before God. In whom the Father was pleased, well pleased. It's like the angel saying to Mary, you are full of grace. What the angel will say to Mary, you are full of grace, meaning that between you and God, there's never been a separation. That's what the angel now says now to Jesus. Jesus who is now, in whom the Father is well pleased, is Jesus who so far lives with the Father. And Jesus would also say that for him, doing the will of his Father is his food. So between Jesus and the Father, the question about walking humbly with our God, it's, it's Jesus' life. It wasn't anything that Jesus had to develop. Jesus always lived before his Father. He lived with his Father, and he and the Father were always one. Then you also ask about doing, acting justly. And acting justly would have us look at a few things, what it means when Jesus acts justly, which will now become the model or the thing that we also would have to do. When Jesus acts justly, Jesus acts in a way that justice means in the scriptures or in the Bible or in the work of salvation. You know, at the beginning when God created humanity, he created three humanity in three levels of relationship. The human person created by God lived in relationship with God, his creator. He lived in relationship with other human beings as brothers and sisters in coexistence. And then he lived in, with the world in which he's created Okay, as a garden uh, in which uh, he had to respect and had to cultivate. So the human person was created in the context of three levels of relationship with God, with his brother, other human beings, and then with his world or with the environment or creation in which he lived. Now, that being the case, relationship, then is a crucial thing about the human existence. Relationship with God, with one another, and with the world in which we live. This relationship then is very crucial and characterizes the life of human person in all regards. Therefore, when we are just, according to the word of scripture, when the scripture refers to anybody as being just, it refers to the person who, re who respects the demands of the relationship in which he lives. When anybody respects the demands of the relationship in which he lives, he's just. The Bible will say tzaddik. Huh? He is he's just. He's a just person, a just man. It's a person who respects the demands of the relationship in which he lives or he exists. The demands of this relationship with God, respect him as God, Father, Creator, relationship with one another, brothers and sisters with whom they live, and relationship with the creation of the earth and which supports our lives. When we respect the demands of this relationship, we just. 
But the Old Testament knows another word. Wickedness. The wicked. The rasha. The wicked or the wickedness in the Bible is the one who does not respect, who breaks the relationship in which people live. So two things are in the, in the, in the Bible. The righteous person and the wicked person. The holy person and the sinner. The righteous person is the one who respects the demands of the relationship in which he exists. Therefore, God is your father. You respect him as your father. You never disobeyed him as happened with Adam and Eve in the Bible. That's how sin began. So when Jesus does justice, it's Jesus who comes to repair the broken relationship in which humanity has lived. Jesus in his justice repairs the relationship in which the human person lives. That's what we call justification. Justification is Jesus who makes us just again. And when Jesus makes us just again, it means Jesus repairs the relationship broken between us and God, between us and one another, and between all the other people we're in relationship with. So when Jesus acts justly, it is Jesus who comes to justify us, who comes to reconcile us with our Father and with one another. It's Jesus who comes to make us just again. So Jesus in the power of the Spirit acts justly. It's Jesus then who in the power of the Spirit repairs the relationship between us and God, between us, one another. It is Jesus who reconciles us. It is Jesus who justifies us. And when we go on then, the second thing about love, goodness, this is again Jesus' life. But more concretely in the gospel, Jesus loves goodness when in the anointing of the Spirit as Stephen in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, would say, Jesus in the power of the Spirit went about doing good. And Jesus who went about doing good was Jesus who went about not only preaching, but also healing, curing, and helping all who were oppressed. So to love goodness, therefore, is to show compassion, is to care, is to lift up the fallen and the broken, and to reintroduce and establish everybody in the strength and the relations of God, their Father. So we know what Jesus did in the anointing of the Spirit. He acted justly, justifying us, reconciling the Father to us, and reconciling us one with one another. He bestowed on us the ministry of reconciliation, enabled us to live, reconcile, in good, restored relationship with one another. And then Jesus who loves goodness is Jesus who comes to do good. Compassionate, touching our situation, and caring for all the situations in which we live in. And it's Jesus who also walks humbly with, our, with his God and Father because that was his nature. Son of God, where in whom the Father was well pleased, is the one for whom to do the will of God was food or his nourishment. So that was Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know what the Spirit is upon me meant in the days of Isaiah. We know what now the Spirit of the, the, the Spirit is upon me meant on the lips of Jesus. Now gathered in this Congress, what we want to say when we now say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, you, me, and all of us gathered here, how do we apply this prophecy of Isaiah, which Jesus came to fulfill, and now to our own situation and to ourselves. <laughs> you can apply it, right? <laughs> Has to be, we have to be able to apply it. We all baptized, right? Yes. And all confirmed, right? Yes. So we all living with the Spirit already, right? So we know how to act justly, right? Yes. We know how to love goodness, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So nobody, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't hear any no. So, so, so I could almost uh, sit down now because they're thinking now. <laughs> Every, every, everything is out there. Yes, but that's, that's how it is. 
Because Jesus did not only want the anointing of the Spirit just on himself. He promised this to his disciples. He said, remain in Jerusalem. John baptized in water, but in a few days you will be baptized, what? With the Holy Spirit. When I go, I'll send the Spirit upon you. So it's, the Holy Spirit was something that Jesus desired and prayed for, for his followers. And ensure that on the, on the day of Pentecost, it did happen to them. Because Jesus did not want his disciples to live this life without a spirit. With, a, with the same anointing that he had begun his mission, he wanted his followers to do, carry on the mission with the same anointing, with the same power, with the same adornment that he had had. So the Holy Spirit was promised, was prayed for, and was ensured for the disciples of Jesus. And so when on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came upon Peter and his fellow apostles, that's what Peter said. My dear friends, these guys are not drunk. It's, it's, it's too early to get drunk. But this is a fulfillment of what the prophet Joel had said, that the days are coming when I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. Not even about 12 apostles, huh? But this time, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And so Peter in preaching, therefore, then indicates how all flesh can make an experience of this spirit. When the people ask Peter, what shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized, and then you will receive and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Peter indicated how anybody can live and enjoy the anointing of the Spirit. Repent and be baptized, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And this has directed the church's life of celebrating baptism and then confirmation and all the other sacraments. But since you all said you've been baptized and all, tell me one thing this morning. What does it mean to be baptized? Water? When they pour water on you, right? Or they, they, they if you know, you, you know, it's poured on you or you can be immersed, whichever way, but you baptize. Something very simple, since I see the clock ticking very fast. There is something that we know sometimes in school we talk about. Sometimes there, there's a talk about you go from the known to the unknown, right? You know that principle. You go in sometimes from the known to the unknown. You go from what you know to discover what you do not know. So we are baptized in Christ. And what does that mean? Let's take a case where this is known. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul talking about the passage of the people of Israel from Egypt and crossing the Red Sea to go with Moses towards the land of promise. Paul reflecting on that episode said that through the crossing of the Red Sea, all of Israel were baptized into Moses. It's not only into Christ that we hear baptism. Paul says that through the passage and the crossing of the Red Sea, all the people of Israel were baptized into whom? Not Jesus. No, no, not Jesus. Jesus has not yet come. Paul says that through the crossing of the Red Sea, all the Israel were baptized into Moses. So what does it mean for the Israelites to have been baptized into Moses? If we understand that, we might be able to understand what it means when we say we baptize into Christ. We know what happened, right? Moses had led the people of Israel out of Egypt because of the very many plagues, and they had come to the banks of the Red Sea, and it was evening. So Moses had the people of Israel relax on the banks, waiting for day fall, uh, waiting for daybreak, when they would find how to cross the sea. And then at night, Pharaoh changed his mind in Egypt and decided to come and get back Israelites for himself. So at midnight, these people encamped on the banks of the Red, uh, the Red Sea, hear the sound behind them, and they raise their eyes and see the chariots and the army of Pharaoh coming in hot pursuit. 
and they felt trapped, trapped between the sea and the army of Pharaoh were coming. And supposing you were there that night, what would you have done? <laughs> try, try, try to imagine a response for yourself. <laughs> if you'd been there that night, what would you have done? There is the Red Sea in front of you. There's Pharaoh and his army, chariots and all coming in hot pursuit. You probably would have said, Moses, let's pick some strong young men and just go and face Pharaoh. If we're able to beat back, Pharaoh would have won our freedom. Some may have thought that way. In fact, I'm not imagining that. You can read all of this in the book of Exodus. <laughs> <laughs> You can, you, can, you, can, you can read all of this from Exodus, between Exodus chapter 12 to chapter 14. You can read about that. And if you want, you can continue the Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. Okay? So, so what happened was that some of these rats also began to cry to the point that Moses also began to cry. And then God said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Take the stick that is in your hand and strike the water. So Moses took the stick and struck the water, and then the water divided into two, and says, you know, all of you walk down. Now, that's the second question coming. <laughs> if you had been there that night, <laughs> and with Moses striking the water, you have a wall of water on one side, and a wall of water on the other side, and there's a passage in the middle, and Moses said, descend down and walk across. Would you have gone? <laughs> Perhaps you would. <laughs> but it's also possible you say, wow, water is never a concrete. <laughs> a and for water to stand like concrete, and what about if we start going and some wind or some storm will blow on the water, whatever? <laughs> you, you could have thought about anything. But the experience is this. For any Israelite to have had the courage that night to step into the bottom of the water to walk across, his words must have been, Moses, into your hands I commend my spirit. <laughs> if your words are not true, and if God is not with you to hold the waters standing as well, and for any reason we'll flow back, we're dead. So any Israel who that night decided to step into the bottom of the sea to walk across, had to say to Moses, Moses, into your words, into your soul, I command my life. Everything, everything of mine is in your hands. And with this attitude, they descended to the bottom and walked across. That is what Paul says that in the crossing of the Red Sea, all of Israel were baptized into Moses. That just means that to be baptized into somebody, you have to deposit. You have to place everything that you have in the words of that person. Otherwise, you're not baptized into him. You know? And so, and so that's, how, that's how Israel, you know, cross, and that's, that's what baptism is. Baptism, therefore, is not a nominal celebration, just pouring of water on us and all of that. But baptism is a decision to live differently from that point, making Jesus your everything. His word is your word. And this decision in gospel, that's what directs your life. You do not, that's what Paul will say in his letter to Romans and Corinthians, the life I live now is no more mine. It is the life I live in Christ Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. Anyone baptized into Jesus lives that life. You don't live your life anymore. But when, until you begin to really surrender your life unto Jesus and live like this, you've not yet begun to live baptism. Until you begin to live, that's, that's, that's when you become a disciple of Jesus. And if Jesus gives a spirit to anybody, he gives a spirit to the life that belongs to him. Jesus does not nourish what does not belong to him. 
It's after people have entrusted their lives into the hands of Jesus that Jesus adorns, that Jesus furnishes, that Jesus anoints that life with the Spirit. It's not any other life. Huh? Jesus does not adorn any other life. It's the life that is handed to him that he takes care of, that he nourishes, that he adorns. So if confirmation comes after baptism, that's what it is. That's why the gifts of the, the gift we celebrate in confirmation are gifts meant for people who have, like the Israelites in the days of Moses, said to Jesus, in your hands I commend my spirit. When my whole life is in the hands of Jesus, then Jesus adorns this life, takes care of it, and feeds and nourishes it. This is baptism. And that's why the first step before we celebrate confirmation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So to understand what the Spirit does to us, we need to understand what we become for Jesus. When we place it all in his hands, then he takes care of us. And the biggest temptation we have is to give it and take it back. <laughs> when, we do, when we do that, we don't give Jesus the chance to take care of our lives. It happened before, right? You know the Acts of the Apostles, the story between Ananias and Sapphira, who had the property they sold and still kept something? Happens all the time with Christians. You give and you keep something for yourself. There's an area of your life that you exercise control over. And you say, Jesus, take care of this area by this corner of my life. That's I'm in charge. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And then in, in, uh, it's so very easy because reasons and excuses that we can find to keep certain areas of our lives under our dominion and power plenty. We can always find them. We can always cook them and we can always formulate them. We find reasons why certain things cannot be handed over to Jesus. But as long as we find reason to do all of that, we've not yet begun this full life of discipleship. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's what it means. Who is the me? The me is the one who has been baptized into Jesus. The me is the one who has surrendered everything to the hands of Jesus. The me is the one who has made Jesus his Lord and all. The me is the one who has begun to speak like Paul. The life I live is no more mine. It is the life that I live in Christ Jesus who gave his life for me. And when we live that way, the Lord takes care of our lives. We're in the U.S., right? You know of Diet Coke? Diet Coke means what? Coke without something, right? <laughs> well, you laugh as if you know where I'm getting to. <laughs> and so you have alcohol-free beer, right? <laughs> so that is beer really without alcohol. And though you have decaf, right? So that's coffee really without the caffeine. So, so, so we have a culture now that, that is taught us to have and still not have. <laughs> and, and we apply that, unfortunately, also to the Christian gospel. And, and so that's what we take and that's what, you know, we leave out. Because it's too inconveniencing. Because it's too challenging. It's too uncomfortable. And so, and, so, and so we leave those behind and aside. But that's not the life of discipleship. So, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's what it means. Let us understand the me on whom the Spirit of the Lord is upon. That's all of us gathered here. But gathered as people baptized into Jesus. Because the Spirit who bestows it, Jesus. He's the, he's the one who said, when I go, I'll ask my Father to send you the paraclete. And when he promised that, he promised that to those who were his disciples. And baptism is meant to make us disciples of Jesus, who subsequently are adorned and nourished by the Spirit. So that's how we begin then to address the second, the other three questions. How do we then live justly? How do we then live love goodness? How do we then, uh, how do we then you know, walk humbly with our God? That's, that's, that's what prepares for it. So how you feel? You okay? 
<laughs> so, you know, I didn't come to make anybody sad. I came, I came, I, I came rather to encourage. I came, I, I came rather to strengthen. And what I'm saying to you is because this is what I believe. I'm not talking theology. I'm not talking whatever type of thing. I, I, I'm, I'm sharing with you what I have come to understand my own life to be as a life, you know, as a Christian disciple and all of that. Because you know what that means? If, 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 if we live this gospel of surrendering something and then keeping something and say, this is my territory and domain, we now are good Christians, we now whatever, but also we are not good priests. You know, you know, you know priests with all kinds of problems, right? Who are not faithful to celibacy, who are not faithful to what? Because there's a domain that is for Christ and a domain that is here I'm in charge. With baptism, there's nothing that you are in charge of anymore. Everything, every, 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 everything is for Christ. So the challenge is a challenge that I, 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 you know, I struggle with, I live, and that's a challenge that I talk about. This word, I've gotten to understand, that's what it means to be baptized into Christ. To give it all to him and have him take charge also of everything that you give to him. He never lets you down, but that's when you place it all into his hands. When happens partially, then he also does partial with you. <laughs> and when he does partial with you, then you don't, you don't understand. You accuse him. But you don't first accuse him. <laughs> so, so that's what it is. Now, after we baptize and anointed this way, then we call to follow Jesus. Like the Acts of the Apostles and the early Christians, then we learn to live together in communion with one mind and one whole soul. Like the Acts of the Apostles, baptizing with the apostles, of the Spirit, they live together in communion. Why in communion? Because that's how they support and sustain each other. That's how they live the unity of the faith that I have gotten. And that communion is what we do in our parishes as church family or parish family or whatever. So the first fruit of being baptized and endowed or anointed with the Spirit is to live in communion, like the early Christians did. And living in communion, we share, we share everything we have with one another. Nobody holds anything for himself. Everything is for everybody. We live a life of solidarity with a life of consent for all. Nobody is left behind and everybody is on board. Then living this life of communion as a church family, we live then as a family of God. I see my, uh, the, the clock is stopped. So it just means that I've exceeded my time, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not reading zero, 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 zero. So, 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 so you know, I, I'll stop. I'll stop, just, you know, uh, if, 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 if I for I turned to Bishop Rickard and asked for five minutes bonus. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in 1995, 94, 95, the cardinals and the bishops and the priests and the lay people in the church gathered in Rome for a synod. They call it the first synod for Africa. And at that synod, they decided to understand the church as the family of God. Because they understood the church to be the place of communion, where we all live together as brothers and sisters. And if you want to know why did, they, why did the bishops choose that, because they realized that on the African continent sometimes, the thing about ethnicity and tribalism sometimes breaks up. Okay, people are in the same parish, but uh, they don't commune. The communion is not there because of tribal differences, because of ethnic differences and all of that. So they decided to look at their self-understanding as church family of God. When we family, we have to step beyond all the divisions and whatever type of thing 
And then when they got together for the second sin of 15 years later, they said the way we can do this is let us practice justice, reconciliation, and peace. So they had two synods. We can apply that to our talk, talk, uh, ourselves this morning. Baptized and anointed with the Spirit, we live in communion. We live in parishes. We live as a church family of God. And living as church family of God, there should be communion. And there in Africa, the challenge was ethnicity, tribalism, and all. Here you have the challenge also of racism, disability, and all of that. They break the communion. They don't make us live as a church family of God. And we are invited and called to live a church family of God. So in all cases, you have the tensions and the challenges that can always come at us. I asked for bonus of five minutes, so I need to cut down my examples. <laughs> Last year, and true, this was real. Two dioceses in Africa were not ready to accept a bishop given them by the Pope because they say they're not from here. You surprised? But that's what ethnicity and tribalism does to the church. They're not, they're not, they're not children of the soil. And I've not yet heard about it because, because of that and being from Africa. So I, I traveled to these two dioceses two times trying to encourage them. Brothers, you cannot pray for the Pope every day at Mass and have objection when he exercises his ministry. You know? Every day at Mass, there's no priest who celebrates a Mass without praying for the Pope. Why do you pray for him? For the exercise of his ministry. And if in the exercise of that ministry you appoint X and Y as Pope, Bishop, then you say, this, I can't accept that. Then why pray for him? Why pray for him? But that's what, that's what, that's what, you know, the challenges like that are posed sometimes in the life of communion. And something similar may well be here too. There are challenges to our life as communion. But that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what all the talk is about. When we are anointed and we pass through the Red Sea like Jesus and say everything now into your hand, then we live with the logic of Jesus, no more with our logic. And what makes sense for us as Catholics and Christians is not no more how we evaluate things and assess them, but it's how the Lord calls us to discipleship. You know, the divisions of ethnicity and tribalism, that used to be there in the Bible. You find that in the first 11 chapters before God called Abraham. But when God called Abraham and blessed him, he said, I'm t Abraham is supposed to teach his children the path of righteousness and justice so they can live as his people. Something began with the call of Abraham. That's what we call the history of salvation. Before salvation, there was a way humanity and mankind lived with all the curses and with all the divisions. But after God called Abraham and then began the work of salvation, we were invited to live beyond the curses of the first 11 chapters of the, gen of the book of Genesis. And living now open to salvation is now living under the influence and anointing of the Holy Spirit, living as children of God. And there can be no children of God which is also divided because one is more child of God than the other one being child of God. It does not exist. So, living and acting justly in the anointing of the Holy Spirit is that. In this family of God in which we live, we need to live justly. Respect the demands of the relationship in which we live. In the church, husband and wife, in the family and all of that. We live, our lives is bound by relationships between us and God between us and another, between the family, father, mother, children, and all of that. All of these are relationships. And when we respect the demands of this relationship, we just. There cannot be a father who doesn't know where his son sleeps at night who is just. There cannot be a, there can, there, 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 there cannot be a father who limits his fatherhood to just a moment of uh, in a moment of celebration of self with somebody and doesn't, it doesn't matter to him now whether somebody is born or where that person is taken care of because it doesn't matter. That's no justice. We, 
We need to repair, we need to repair a, lot of com a lot of conduct in our life because justice, it is to respect the demands of the relationship in which we live. And this demand is not just between us and God, but between all of us, God, and in the parish family. They see who is the usher, there's one who is the church president, there's who is the church, this and all. We all bound in this network of relationships. And when we respect the demands of these relationships, we act justly. But we can also be wicked. <laughs> and that's when we disregard the relationships and break them. And how is our society not affected by broken relationships? The other day, three weeks ago, I was invited to St. John's University to, 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 to give the commencement address. And the team they have chosen was homelessness. So I say homelessness, what does it mean? It's not only when some war or drought or something is driven you from your land. Here in the city civilized state, we still have homeless people. Because I know people whom the, whom the court puts on the street because of a settlement of divorce. As part of the settlement of divorce, somebody cannot live in the same house with another. He has to leave the house. And where does he go to live? On the street, whatever. These are demands of the court. So sometimes, sometimes the failure to live in proper relations produce homelessness. It's not only here. We met them in Italy. We met them. We meet them everywhere. So the demands act justly. That means let's respect the demands of the relation in which we live. And, and, and you know, time does not allow me to list any whatever, but we live with them. There's nobody, even when you take a taxi, you, there is a relationship that has been established. The taxi driver is accepted to take you to a destination, and you accept to pay the taxi driver. There is a relationship. If the taxi driver would not take you to where you're going, the relationship is broken. All kinds of things. Every day, our lives are bound by relationships, which require us to respect them. So let's keep the sanity of our society, the sanity of our homes and families, the sanity of the relationship we live in by respecting the demands of the relationship in which we live, that is to act justly. Then let us love goodness. And if you want to know what goodness is or where to find it, the first chapter of the book of Genesis said, everything that God created was what? <laughs> and indeed, very good. So you want to know what is good to love? Beginning with what God has created. If everything that God created was good, start loving what God has created. And then you will come to the human person who is the summit of that. And the one who was created in the image and likeness of God and who is the summit of that is the one who needs most to be loved. So, love goodness, that's what you have it everywhere around you. Love what God has created and most importantly, the summit of this thing, which is the human person. And this human person created in the image and likeness of God was created with dignity. And dignity is not something that the law court gives to another. Dignity is something that we have by reason of our creation, the image and likeness of God. And therefore, something that we share. And by reason of the fact that we're born brothers and sisters, we share this. I do not expect... You know, you to you know, be Greek scholars or anything like that. But for example, the word for brothers in Greek is adelphos, meaning from the same womb, okay? And that is suggests that people from the same womb have the same nature and dignity. Therefore, there cannot be brothers from the same womb having somebody who has more dignity than another. That's why the creation story places us all in the same womb of Adam and Eve. Meaning that we all from the same womb and be having the same parentage. It just means that all of us have the same dignity and there's no human being who has more dignity than another. This is the basic story of scripture. So when we love what God has made and everything what God includes a human person, that's why it is we love in God. And then we walk humbly with our God. That is our personal life of spirituality. Walk humbly with our God seeking his will. Seeking what is desired was 
finding a place to seek his face all the time, find a place of prayer. And all of us, Catholics that we are, we should have some five minutes of some moment where we always seek the face of God in prayer because that's how we begin to walk.